for permission to speak. Thank you. This morning I'm going to speak from Matthew 18 verses 1 through 6. That's Matthew 18 verses 1 through 6. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of, the, one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I thank God this morning for life, health, and strength. I thank God for being in me, with me, through me, and for me. I thank the Agbana Society for asking me to speak, uh, being in the long tradition of ministers from this church who've had this opp opportunity uh, to present thanking my pastors in their absence, and I'm hoping actually Pastor Wilson has a plane to get on, so I'm praying that uh, all goes well and he gets on his plane. His flight was canceled yesterday, so he's still en route trying to get down to Selma. want to thank the Honorable Marion Barry this morning, uh, those who will be assembling this morning for the unveiling of his statue down at the Wilson uh, building this morning. So this is a historic day in our city. Amen. And to Mother Akil, who I'm very saddened to hear that she's gone on to Ancestry, and to Mother Maddie Evans, and Mother Ruth Rewbanks, and so many others, fellow clergy officers and friends, I ask God this morning to remove me and increase him. And uh, I want to thank my wife for that introduction uh, this morning. I didn't know what she was going to say. <laughs> a little nervous over there. She, she told y'all all the good stories. <laughs> this morning, God, we seek your wisdom and guidance as we look at our school system that is in shambles. Today, we look at these school shootings that are happening across the country uh, this morning. We're looking at our young people with these drive-by shootings uh, all over the place. And we're also looking at our, our young people being absent from the church. I don't take it lightly or don't take this opportunity lightly and understand that a sermon should inspire someone to do something or to take action. In the text that, that I read this morning, the disciples had a predisposed notion or an idea that Jesus was going to set up this kingdom of heaven here on earth that would be full of splendor and that his, in his role as the Messiah and in their deliberations, they wished to know who was the greatest in the kingdom or who would have principal offices or certain posts of honor and who would make the profit or gain something. This amongst the disciples was a frequent subject of inquiry and controversy. Mark informs us that they had this dispute so often that Jesus inquired of them, what were they disputing about? The disciples at first were silent through their shame. But perceiving that the subject of their dispute was known, Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to answer you. Jesus called the little child. He called that child unto him, and he set that child in the midst of them. And he said, except that ye be converted, no such things would take place. And that these ideas of a hierarchy and, and, and comparing him to earthly kings 
did not fit at all into the nature of his kingdom. Jesus extolled them to be like little children. Little children are, 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 are great. They're, they're, they're destitute of ambition and pride. They are characteristically humble and they are teachable. This morning, the church faces a, a, a serious dilemma or crisis. I want to take a poll this morning. How many young people do we have in the house under the age of 21? Raise your hand. I don't see many. So that you can inscribe this message in your mind this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> because Jesus extolled his disciples to become like little children, how can we even begin to take on that characteristic when the children or our youth are not in the house? And I'm not just talking about those children that we have purview over. I'm talking to about those children that for whatever reason, they are not embracing the church, the very institution that they need to come to. But maybe it's because we are so busy solidifying our position in the kingdom, like the disciples, that we have written them off as a lost generation. Society and the media have painted a picture that says, just here in Washington, D.C. alone, we have a high percentage of 16 and 19 year olds who are not enrolled in school and they're not working. A high rate of unemployment amongst 20 to 24 year olds. A high percentage of drug use amongst 18 to 25 year olds. And a high percentage of 18 to 24 year olds who account for all of the homicide victims in our city. But not only that, there are only 9,000 summer jobs for young people that they have funding for right now because the council took away some of the funding. 19,000 young people registered. President Trump has taken DC tag out of his budget for physical year 2019. DC tag is a major source of funding for young people going to college. And just yesterday, with three and a half months to go to graduation, just 42% of 3,692 high school seniors in the DC public school system, the class of 19, are on track to graduate in June. And we said no child left behind. <laughs> Come on now, teach you. What are and who sets the standards for today's generation? What are the cultural norms for our young people in community today? Whatever happened to if you don't go to church, you can't go outside? Can't go outside. Come on, come on. Whatever happened to the elders on the block that told on you when you did something wrong? Whatever happened to that house on the block where everybody gathered? Whatever happened to having to be in the house when the street lights came on? What happened to families sitting at the dinner table, eating meals and having discussions? Whatever happened to young people coming to meet the parents when they got into a relationship? Whatever happened to going to grandma's or grandpa's house during the summer? I love spending time with my grandmother, who, as my wife said, migrated to Atlantic City from South Carolina. She gave birth to 16 children. So there were a lot of us. And at any given time in that house, there could be 50 to 60 people. I don't know how we all fit it in there. But when I say grandmother, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the classical definition of a grandmother. I'm talking about a woman who upheld the family tradition and set a moral tone for the family. A woman who had rules and standards, who could throw down in the kitchen, yes. who had you on your knees every night and every morning praying, who took care of other people's kids, 
who lines you up in the morning to get that spoonful of castor oil. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. mint on the end. Come on now. Come on. Yeah. And who also sent you outside to get that switch. That switch. Yeah. Yeah. Go get it yourself. Yeah. When you out on. My wife talked about how we had Sunday school in the living room. But I wasn't the only person in that bed. It was so crammed in there, if you got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you wouldn't have a spot <laughs> when you came back. So on Sunday mornings, yes, we had to fold the couch up, go wash your face and your hands, and you were in church. It was a family tradition. So when I grew up, I felt strange on Sunday when I wasn't in church. There was, a, there was a feeling that went through my body when I wasn't in the church. My grandmother was so respected. We used to walk down the street and there could be guys out there shooting dice and drinking. And they would say, oh, Miss Corby coming. And they would put it up real quick. And I would look back and see them, you know, they get it back out. But she commanded that type of respect. I'm talking about grandmothers. No disrespect to the grandfathers in here. But being in this room, and as I look at the elders, the grandmothers, the great-grandmothers, the grandfathers and the great-grandfathers, who are close to the traditions and culture of our African ancestors. And I look at future generations of grandmothers, and I wonder what will they pass down to future generations? Today, I see grandmothers pulling their kids in the street and cussing them out. Letting them do whatever they wanted to do. God has blessed me to work with young people for many years, but now I'm working with adults. And I happen to work with some adults who kids work for me. I ain't talking about Sister Connie. I ain't talking about Adrian, because Adrian did work with me. But there were some kids I used to wonder about and say, why in the world is this kid acting like that? And then I met their parents. And I said, that, that old ad is the apple don't fall too far from the tree. It came to life. Just like my grandmother passed down the cultural tradition of going to church on Sunday, it didn't matter what church you went to. It had to be some type of church. I went to so many different types of churches, AME, AME Zion, Christian Science, Baptist, and the Church of God. My mother even kept the tradition of being in the house when the street lights came on. I grew up in Park Morton Public Housing Complex up in Northwest Washington, the projects as they call it. It was a tight-knit community predominantly female head of house. My friends, my, my crew, my homeboys, we did everything together. Sports, parties, pursuing the ladies, street corner harmony, and other mischief. Even in the so-called projects, there were etiquettes, yes. protocol, and culture. Yes. We shared and we watched each other's back. And we played the dozens in Jonin, as, 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 as we called it. But there were certain unofficial rites of passage in the community and certain proven grounds that you had to go through. One of those proven grounds was who had to go in the house first? Yeah. <laughs> or who had the earliest curfew? Come on, man. The worst thing in the world was your mother coming to the window and calling your name. <laughs> It was, it was like the mother had a frequency. You could be two, two blocks away and you heard a voice. But here you were on the blocks with your mans, as they call it. Say, that's my mans right there, as the young people say now. And your mother comes to the window and calls your name and the whole block could hear it. And there was a sense of mama's boy's embarrassment and you got heckled all the way to the door. <laughs> My curfew was at 10 o'clock, but 
every once in a while, you would stretch that thing out as long as you could. Especially if you was out with the girls. You, you had to stay out. But to my chagrin, Channel 5 had a voice that would come on at 9.59 and 59 seconds every night that would say it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And unfortunately, my mother watched the 10 o'clock news every night. So I knew at 9.59 that I need to go ahead and find an excuse to go in the house so my mother wouldn't have to go to the window and call my name. But at 10 o'clock, she could always answer yes. But in today's society, many parents can't even answer that question because the standards have changed. Mothers and grandmothers now smoke and drink with their children. Okay. Yeah. Parents don't send their kids down south no more for the summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Young people hang out to whatever time in the morning and they had to pass a curfew law in this city. Yeah. The dropout rate is sky high and parents don't even make their children go to church anymore. Sure. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Again, what are the standards? Who is setting them? One of the biggest problems I see in today's society is the gap of engagement between our elders and our youth. The young people don't hold the elders in reverence. And the elders are afraid of the youth. Some elders say the ways of the youth are dangerous and demonic. And the youth say the elders are stuck in their ways. But how will our children become who they should be? Peter 5 and 5 says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. We wait too long to engage them. Our tendency has been to wait until they get older. And then we have to work to unlearn all of those bad habits. How will the tradition? the culture, the stories, and the wisdom carry on. One of the, the greatest scenes in the movie Black Panther, and I'm not going to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, required the leader to go back to the elders in order for him to move on. They had a dialogue, and even though they didn't agree, they came together to agree to disagree. <laughs> But now the elders and the children don't have a dialogue. And that is so necessary in the healing of our community. Even those of us who are 55 now continue to duck our ascension into the Arbonne Society. Say so. Say so. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm started. You see, one of the major components to turning around the issues concerning our children are the elders. Yes, it is. Think about the adversity that you came through. Think about all the struggle that you came through. Think of the sacrifices that you have made. And look at how you've been able to overcome. Yeah. But here we got these kids with these computers and smartphones and they get, you know, three meals a day. And they get mad when you give them an order. When you tell them to do some chores. But just like the disciples, it seems as though that we are waiting for an oasis. And that place in society. You see, the system has, has, has lulled the elders to sleep. You work for 20 to 30 years. You pay the house off. You retire. It's paradise. You don't have to work no more. You can go and do the things and travel to the places that you want to go to. You say, I can sit down now. But retirement doesn't mean that it's time to sit down or retire from the community. What about the children? It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And I'm not just talking about from a physical standpoint. Do you know where they are mentally? Do you know where they are psychologically? Come on. 
Do you see the telltale signs of that behavior? What I'm saying is that the elders need to be more engaged now than ever. In that spirit, I have two things we need to do to make a difference in the lives of our children and to begin to bridge the gap between the children and the elders. Because we've tried so many things. All of this scientific, the doctor said this, and the PhD said this, and this study said this, and that study did, said that. They even changed the laws and said you can't even put your hands on your children. It was that hand, it was that switch, and it was that Hot Wheel track, and it was that belt. Uh -huh. That made me think about sometimes yeah. when my friends was about to go do something, I had to determine whether I wanted to be involved or not. We must teach our children critical thinking skills. The ability to think clearly and rationally about what to do or what to believe. In other words, they need to know what type of thinkers they are. Teach. Proverbs 14 and 15 says that the simple believes everything, mm -hmm. but that the prudent gives thought to his steps. Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered what was on the mind of the kid that walked into the church in Charleston and killed all those people? Do you wonder what was on the mind of the kid that went into the school in Florida and killed all those people? As a matter of fact, what type of thinker are you? What makes you make the decisions that you make today? Of course, we can say the mistakes and experiences that we had. We can talk about the culture of our neighborhoods. When I was growing up, I lived in Northwest growing up, and we used to come to Southeast, it was like another city. But there were things that people did in Northwest that were different than what people did in Southeast. But it was the culture of the neighborhood sometimes that made you make a decision or do a certain thing. The city trends, when people wore a certain piece of clothing or certain uh, uh, gears they called it. I remember they had these things called gorilla boots. And some guys wore them to school one day and I ran home, Mom! I need a pair of Gorilla Boots. <laughs> and so she took me down to the general store and I got a pair of Gorilla Boots and it snowed the next day and I put my Gorilla Boots on and when I got to school, my feet was wet. <laughs> oh, my and I wonder why I brought those Gorilla Boots. <laughs> our parents influenced our decision making as young people and even today. I can remember I was one of the few kids in the projects who father lived with. Him. And I relished the fact that my father was in the house. And sometimes we would walk to the store and I would, hey, I got a daddy. And I'm walking with my daddy. But we talk about the, the reasoning and, 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 and how one day somebody told me, you're just like your daddy. I said, no, I ain't. I'm my old man. But when I used to walk with my daddy, we would be walking down the street. And every time, sometimes when a woman would walk past, my father would turn and look back. So when my father looked back, I looked back too. Why not? I didn't know what I was looking at. But that's what my daddy did. Until one day I was walking with my aunt. And we were walking down the street and this woman walked past and I looked back. And my aunt said, what you looking at? I said, I don't know. That's what daddy do. I ain't mean to dry snitch on my father, but. Again, critical thinking, not knowing why you are doing something, but just because somebody else did it. Critical thinking is even affected in a region. I used to go down in North Carolina. And now North Carolina, I mean, that's a friendly, friendly place. They used to stand at the corner and, and, and gather at this place. 
And one day I was walking up there and I was bored. I said, man, I, cause I, I, don't, I can't stand on the corner every day and, 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 and just do nothing. And I said, man, y'all show some bammers down here. <laughs> How can that dude wear a pair of red pants and a purple shirt? <laughs> And why do everybody got gold teeth in their mouth? <laughs> and when did soda become pop? And my cousin said to me, well, they said that you was a bama. <laughs> me? Yeah, they said you unfriendly. I said, why would they say that? Because they would stand on the corner and every car that came by, they waved their hand. They said, you don't, they said, you don't wave. I said, because in Washington, D.C., when a car comes by, you got to do like this. Wow. If I got caught on a corner in D.C. doing waving at every car coming by, somebody might rob me. Talking about critical thinking. How many of us have been in a situation, you in the jam, something about to come up, a decision got to be made, may have been caught, may have been about a relationship, may have about, been about something at your job, and you looked up in the air and you said, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll never do it again. How many of us did it again? What type of critical thinking is that? We must make our young people better critical thinkers, but we can't do that unless we get them to the table. Number two, we must find ways and activities where our elders and children spend more time together. One of my greatest regrets is that I don't have any video footage of my grandmother on my mother's side of the family. I got my, my father's mother, but I didn't get my mother's mother. My children, other than stories or photos, don't know my grandmother. With all this technology and smartphones, I'm proposing today, because I said we gotta take some action. We need the Agbana Society, manhood and womanhood training, the Omni Ministry, the Youth Choir, to come together and organize a family history project. Yes. We can develop 15 yes. questions that every young person, or if you have a grandparent or great grandparent out there that they need to video, use the smartphones for us in a smart way. Mm -hmm. Even if they got to do it on an iPod, mm -hmm. to videotape and get that history. We miss getting mother killed. We didn't sit her down and get that history and so many others. We must prepare this generation because we put so much hope in them. We put so much promise in them. We said it takes a village to raise a child. We say, wake up all the teachers. Time to teach a new way. Maybe they will listen to what you have to say because they're the ones who's coming up and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children, Teach them the very best you can. We say Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We also sing, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. We also said, Father, help your children. Don't let them fall by the side of the road and teach them to love one another so heaven might find a place in their heart. We said, oh, child, things are going to get easier. Oh, child, things are going to get brighter. Someday, We'll get it all together, and we'll get it all done. But we also said, Mama may have. Papa may have. But God bless the child that has his own. 
Thank God for kids. There's a magic for a while. A special kind of sunshine and a smile. Do you ever stop or think to wonder why the closest thing to heaven is a child? Let us embrace our children because it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? God bless you.